When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass-fed and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Well, you know, the the best way to think about it is really all about ensuring that you have enough for the potentially disastrous events, right? The thing that we, for whatever reason as humans, is like I have explicit coverage for my wife's engagement ring. But like we really can't lose everything if something bad happens to that ring. And so the the insurance that you really don't need is insurance that can't ruin you. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Compton Game, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 4.5% APY on an 8-month CD special or 4.25% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash cdspecials. Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC. Welcome back to the show, my friend. It is so, so good to have you here. A little news on my front, we're actually moving cross country in a few weeks, and I am so excited. I've been wanting to do this for years. We're finally taking the plunge. I'm going to tell you all about it in upcoming episodes, and I will, of course, spill all my moving money-saving hacks and tricks for you. But that leads into this episode. There are just some episodes that we do that I feel are like masterclasses in 30 to 40 minutes, and this is one of those. If you own a home, homeowner's insurance is a necessity. You can't get around it. 
I even argue if you're renting, you should definitely have renter's insurance, right? You have stuff, you definitely need insurance to cover that stuff. But there are endless questions. How much do you need? How much money should you spend? What should you do about your deductible? Well, lucky for you, Steve Likas, who is the co-founder and CEO of Branch Insurance, is here to educate and demystify all things homeowner's insurance. So Branch Insurance, they pioneered the quickest way to bundle home and auto insurance completely online. It's really cool. We talk about it all, including my very favorite insurance policy that you definitely need to have in this episode. I'm Shauna Compton-Game. This is Millennial Money. I'm so thrilled to bring this episode to you. Let's jump in. We're talking about a topic that hopefully is not deterring people from listening to this episode because I know we are going to share so many gems. We're talking about insurance and home insurance in particular, which uh, is an episode we actually have not done on this podcast before. So I'm really excited to to dive into this. And, um, you know, I, I kind of just want to start out laying the foundation because I think it's really important. So tell me a little bit, you're the expert. Tell me a little bit, like, what is home insurance and why the heck do we even need it? You know, it's a funny thing. Um, home insurance has been around since 1950. Uh, actually, insurance kind of generally in the United States grew up as a product called fire insurance because people will would build their home or their business and uh, the primary risk was that it would burn down and they'd lose all of the, mm. uh, the money that they'd invested. But home insurance or any kind of insurance, what's so great about it is that like you and I got to grow up not knowing what it would be like to have to ask the question of, should I ever drive a car? Because like, <laughs> if I did, you know, I could cost a million dollars to someone or myself and I don't have a million dollars. And like, I would go back below the poverty line if I took the risk of driving a car. And so we don't have to think about that at all. And that's a beautiful thing, right? Like we get this wonderful ability to transfer that risk to someone else and then go about building like our life's positive trajectory. And so if that's like the product itself, which, you know, is so important to understand because that's so much about how you should think about spending money on it. And, and I'll tell you then how to not spend as much money on it, that, um, that home insurance is a product that in 1950, we put together a bunch of products, fire insurance, um, liability coverage, um, contents coverage, like your stuff moving around, uh, which um, these products were all sold separately. Uh, and we created a bunch of efficiency by bringing them together. The primary things that home insurance covers then is it covers your house, like the place you live, if you have to repair it or rebuild it uh, from, you know, the types of things that, that can cause it to go bad. It covers that stuff, uh, frequently covers them anywhere around the world. Um, and, uh, and <clears throat> uh, you know, the things that you love uh, and the things that you don't even realize you have, like your house burns down and you have to think about all those napkins that have been in a, a dining room drawer that no one's touched in forever. Um, it covers you for personal liability. Uh, like if somebody gets hurt on your property, you know, people think about this like kids jumping on trampolines or, or slips and fall or, or something around your pool, if you're so fortunate to have one. Um, and then it'll also cover things like detached structures. You know, if you've got a, a detached garage or a, a fence or those types of things. And then um, the last couple of things it covers are medical expenses for guests who are injured as a result of um, something else mm. that's, that happens bad that's covered by the product. And then if your house, you know, something terrible does happen and you can't live in it, then there's coverage to um, put you up somewhere else um, so that you're not trying to figure out like, where am I going to live? It's great that I've got the ability to repair. Uh, those are the primary things that the home insurance covers. I'm just thinking about what you shared, like thinking about, I never knew that, that it was created basically in the fifties, which is actually not that long ago. I mean, that's like in my parents' lifetime, uh, maybe some of the listeners like grandparents' lifetime. 
So what happened before that? Did you did you just like inherently take on all that risk yourself? You know, it depended. Um, actually, there were products. They didn't exist the same way. And so think this is actually what happened, uh, Shauna, was you could go out and buy a general liability policy. And that way, if somebody slipped and fell at your house, they couldn't sue you for, you know, all that you own. Right. And then you could also go out and buy uh, a fire policy. And the fire policy was just if the house burned, nothing else was covered, just fire. Right. And then you could go out and buy an all other peril policy, which was kind of like a lot of the other stuff other than fire. And then your contents, the stuff that you own, were not covered. And you could go out and buy a policy to cover just your stuff. And so the, the uh, invention in 1950, what was so cool about it was that it was uh, a method of bundling the products where the insurance company got this huge efficiency and were mm. able to pass all of that savings back to the consumer that bought all the products in the one bundle. And as a result, the consumer got this thing that they had to think a lot less about, right? Right. It covered so much more yeah. stuff and it was significantly cheaper. And you can imagine like way easier and way cheaper. It became the standard inside of 10 years. It was a, a kind of an amazing shift in the marketplace. Wow. That's cool. I like it. I like learning the history of things. That's really cool. And you, you also talked about like those napkins that are hidden somewhere in a drawer that we never think about. So how do we, like, how do we just is, because I feel like we all just kind of get I don't want to use the word lazy, but we just live life. We're in our houses. We're using our stuff. Is there a way to keep like an easy way to keep like an inventory of, of what we actually have? There are a bunch of different tools, but so far I've not found one that I thought was easy. Right. I mean, the fundamental okay. problem is, is first I have to go catalog it all. And second, I have to maintain the catalog. And I think right. we're getting closer technologically to where you could take an, uh, like a video inventory and we can translate the video into data and you could do that with some uh, recurrence, but so far not really. And that, that actually is kind of the home insurance product thinks about that. So you get a, uh, a big number for coverage and it's very rare that anyone uses more than that number. Uh, and so your your claims team, if you've got a, a good claims team at your insurance company, will help you work through, like, how do I quantify all the stuff that I had, especially if the house is now totally gone? Wow. Um, and so it hasn't it hasn't had to be so specific, um, but um, but there hasn't I haven't found tech yet that makes that really simple. I feel like somebody needs to, like, steal that idea. <laughs> There's got to be somebody listening that is like super tech savvy. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell me about like, so you talked about like policies usually cover, you know, so much. So do, do you as the consumer determine how much coverage you need or is that like, how is that number determined? Well, it's this, it's the single biggest decision. The most important decision you should make when buying any insurance policy is just how much of it do you buy? It's a, this is a funny thing about insurance too, because none of us want to pay any more than we have to for it, and, and like that's actually <laughs> so much about why we I started the company that I, I've started. But it's it's the it's the wrong end of the problem to solve. You know, really, it is. Um, the The big thing is when you tra when you transfer that risk to an insurance company, like. If you have $100,000 of coverage and you own $500,000 of stuff, then there is a chance that you would use the 100,000 and you'd be liable for, you know, the rest of all you own. And so like that when people think about how much coverage they need, the insurance company will try to assist. Ultimately it's the it's the your choice and mine. Uh, and we have to live with that choice. And, and there's tremendous tools out there to help think about it. The, the primary way that a, a home insurance policy uh, coverage is 
chosen or suggested to a, a consumer is there is technology today that allows us with you know a dozen or two dozen uh, characteristics of your property to uh, theoretically stick rebuild the home. I, I just mean like what would the lumber and the nails and the shingles cost in your area? And what do people charge for that type of job in your area? And the combination of those materials and labor is what it would cost if your house burned to the ground and had to be fully rebuilt just like it was the day before the bad thing happened. <clears throat> and so typically the guidance that you'll receive is uh, this estimate of rebuilding is the amount of uh, total coverage that you should buy. Just a good, it's a good method of okay. it works quite well. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. We've all spent more time with family lately. It can feel like old times, but your mind is on the future too, and what you can do to shape it. At Sandy Spring Bank, we work with clients to help them grow and protect their money with wealth management, trust services, and insurance, so they can enjoy today and ultimately pass along their wealth. We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your dreams. Visit sandyspringbank.com wealth. Wealth and insurance products are not FDIC insured, not guaranteed, and may lose value. Okay. I like that. I can wrap my brain around that one. And you you talked about cost. I mean, we're all about making smart money moves on this show. So again, you're the expert. Like, Are there any insider secrets for how we shop for insurance and, and find the best rates? Like, What do we need to know? Yeah. Yeah, there are uh, actually. Um, and they're, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, like any... Uh, like anything, especially a commodity that you could buy from 300 different companies, uh, <laughs> there are, um, you know, there's typically an idea of like cost and then something above cost. In an insurance, it's a little bit different because we don't know what it costs to make the product for a few years after we sell it, right? The, like the business is right. predicting the future. Will there be claims or won't there? 
And there's an idea of equity, right, of fairness. And, and the, the definition of fairness that you find most prevalent in the insurance industry, I'm not judging this idea positively or negatively, is that the people who have more claims well, actually, maybe back up one step. Insurance itself is a pooling of resources, right? So, Sean, if you and I are insured in the same insurance company, then if something bad happens to you and nothing bad happens to me, then my premiums pay your claims, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, the old idea of insurance is that it's actually a community of people who would band together and pool small bits so that the unfortunate few could take a big chunk when they needed it. Right. We, we've kind of like confused that over the years. Big brand marketing would make you think that you're like someone is saving you. Um, but it's actually not that way. Like the pure mechanics are everyone else in the community is who you're relying on. But if that's the case and it's just you and me, Sean, and, and we're insured by the same insurance company and I make up a claim like you don't want the insurance company to pay me with your money because that would be a bad use of the funds. And the other part of that idea is if I had five claims and you had zero, then you should want me to pay more for insurance, right? Um, yeah. Because I'm using all of the, the community's resource. And so in that method, like the, the idea of equity is people who claim more should pay more for insurance. And that's why you see so many questions you have to answer for an insurance company to give you even an estimate of what it would cost. But directly to your question, what that means is that everyone's doing different math for predicting the claims future. And especially in homeowners, you'll get more different answers company to company the more companies that you shop. But as the, the data science becomes better, and you'll find this more in auto insurance, predicting the future in large numbers is a lot easier. Uh, in car insurance. We, we've become pretty sophisticated as an industry in doing that. And once you've done that, once you've set that baseline of what claims are going to be, then cheaper insurance is all about the overhead of the business. And so what I mean is it, one of the wild things about this industry is that even though it's really old industry and there's hundreds of competitors you know, only about half of premiums pay claims, even though that was the purpose of the product. That's the simple idea, right? Pooling resources so that big chunks can be taken by the few injured. And so what you found in our space is, um, is the companies that um, have a lot of intermediaries, have a lot of overhead, their customers have to pay for that overhead. And the thing that I think is really wild and not really that that okay is that we've learned, and I say we, like the insurance industry has learned, that the more they market, the more they can get people to shop. And because everybody wow. runs out of shopping energy after answering the same question, like the same 50 questions, like three times they know that they just have to get you to think of them when you're shopping to get a chance to acquire you. But the part about it I don't like is that, you know, all it does is recycle your money and mine, right? It, through acquisition, through television networks and Google, when insurance isn't actually its own product, it's a product uh, that's a byproduct of you buying a house or a car or renting a house or whatever it is you wanted to do. And so, sneaky. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, the, it's not super illogical in, in retrospect, right? Like, um, you know, these companies want to grow and they've found that this method works. It also leads to tactics like, like giving out teaser rates and then increasing your premium because they were able to acquire you. They know through the behavioral data that you really don't want to go through the shopping experience again because it's unfun. Um, <laughs> but uh, but the other than secret is the companies with a lower cost structure will be on average cheaper and frequently significantly. And I think where you'll see the market move is you'll find insurance in those other transactions, which can make it much less expensive. Uh, and I think that's really good. I mean, I think 
if if less than half or about half of premiums paid claims, it's not efficient for you or me. And if the good thing insurance does is allow us to pursue a, a life's trajectory without having to think about losing everything, we should make that accessible to more people by making it less expensive and allowing people to spend that money on those dreams. Uh, and so I think yeah. like those are some of the things that are underlying um, you know, all those TV ads you see. Yeah. And I would imagine that that is probably the premises for your company branch. I know you, you really like to help people save on, on all different types of insurance. So I just, I have to ask the question, what made you interested really in specializing in something that is not everyone's favorite topic? Yeah. You know, um, it's a funny thing, Shauna. I was like you, I grew up in the Midwest, uh, in Ohio and I was, um, you know, getting ready to put myself through college and I was going to school for tech or planning to, and I found a big insurance company, uh, within bike riding distance to my parents' house where I was living while I was putting myself through college. I was a sophomore at the time. And I found this big insurance company that would pay for school. And so I, this was a money problem for me. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so I uh, started working there. I uh, couldn't get into IT. I was too um, inexperienced. So I started in claims taking phone calls from consumers when they had a terrible thing happen um, and really feeling what the product did. Um, then I moved into tech and then underwriting and product development. Uh, I got the cool opportunity to build the first online home insurance business in the nation and then I, I ran a large data aggregator selling data to insurance companies. And along the way, I saw that insurance could actually be less expensive. There was a structural flaw that, that we could eliminate and we could stop, uh, stop abusing our customers' money and make insurance good because uh, it was designed to be good. We just, you know... It had maybe lost its way in the in the marketing warfare and corporate institutionalism. And so there was a point along that path. That's how I got into it. And then that's what, what uh, compelled me to get out. Yeah, I have to have you share a funny story you shared with me. I won't name the company, but you, you talked about your first paycheck where they actually sent your annual salary in your first uh, check and then was like, Hey, 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 don't cash it. Yeah. It was uh, one of those amazing clerical errors, but uh, not the kind of treasury <laughs> chess card you get to keep. So I, I was, um, I was in an eight week training program and, um, and my annual salary was set to be about $24,000, uh, as a sophomore in college, um, which I'm a super old millennial, um, uh, uh, born right at the beginning of, of uh, our window. And so tw- right there with yeah, you. <laughs> tw- 24 grand. I mean, I was pumped uh, living right? in, uh, outside of Akron, Ohio. And, um, and so by the time I got home, the day that I received my check, there was a FedEx mail, uh, a piece of mail in an envelope that said, please do not try to cash that check. There's been a, a stop uh, <laughs> payment on the check. Uh, but I mounted it and hung it in my cube for for a number of years after. Nice aspirational goals, right? right. <laughs> I love that. Well, I, one of the types of insurance um, that you sell at Branch is actually a product that I actually put on my list as probably the, the smartest or a smart money move to make. That's umbrella insurance, and I think so many people have never heard of it. But as a CFP. I could probably share for hours and hours how having this policy has saved like a lot of people that I personally know from from financial ruin. Uh, tell us because we've never talked about this on the show. Like, what do we need to know about umbrella policies? Yeah, Sean, it's a great question, and this goes right back to thinking not just about you know what's my deductible, like what'll I be out of pocket when the thing happens at the bottom end, but about what could happen at the top end. So what umbrella coverage does, and the reason it's called umbrella, is that it it goes over your other insurance policies and then extends in in some ways uh, 
as first coverages, uh, frequently for things like uh, personal liability. Um, but if you had $100,000 of uh, auto liability coverage and, and you had you know, a child at home, new driver, and that, that child caused real damage in your car, you might blow through your $100,000 of auto coverage quite quickly. And so now, you know, it's not the issue of, well, it was my deductible $500 or $1,000 and I'm out $500. I right. wish I wasn't. It's like I'm staring at a $100,000 bill or a a um, million dollar bill and everything that I've worked so hard for my whole life is at risk. Um, and so umbrella is really designed and frequently discussed um, for people and by people who have built a number of things to protect. Typically you're buying this coverage in um, million dollar denominations, million, two million, five million, ten million. And so, uh, you know, as we all age and, and hopefully we've done well in creating some wealth and assets around us, Umbrella is a really inexpensive way to transfer a, um, you know, that risk of starting from zero, uh, which uh, unfortunately as an insurer, uh, you know, I have as many of those horror stories as you do. Yeah. And I'm glad that you mentioned uh, affordable because it actually is really, really, really affordable. Uh, and you know, something that, uh, I think is as you're, as you're growing your wealth, like you mentioned, is it, is a good thing to at least just think about, think about what that might be, because we talk on this show, obviously a lot about building our wealth, but we also have to talk like in this episode about protecting it because the protecting it is just as important as, as the growing it. And you mentioned, you know, so many different stories throughout this episode of, of different ways that you could, you know, get at a place where you're staring at a bill and it's like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do from here. It's a really scary moment. I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I always tell people when they think about their deductibles, buy the biggest one that you're comfortable losing, right? And that's easy to say, but the 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 mental model I use is if you've ever been to a blackjack table for the first time, and everyone around you is kind of coaching you and the dealer flips over an ace and the dealer asks if anyone wants to buy insurance and everyone at the table tells you not to do it because it's bad math, right? It's overly expensive to buy the insurance so long as you have enough uh, remaining money to, to rebet and cover that loss. And so like insurance actually buying, you know, home or car insurance so much the same way because an insurance company is inefficient, right? I just said that most of the big insurance companies you know, like 40% of the premium goes to waste. You know, the vast majority of it's just their expense structure. Profits are pretty lean. And so if you knew that of your deductible, of the premium that, um, that you pay, uh, that lowest level is some of the most expensive because those are the most frequent claims. And you'd be way better off just putting a grand in the bank if you could afford it and bumping your deductible by that $1,000. Um, it would be a more efficient spend for the vast majority of people. Uh, and similarly then, uh, you know, focus on the top end of the funnel because uh, there isn't a good answer for how would I replace everything. Um you know, we had a, a case like this not long ago, uh, and I kind of referenced almost a, as a real example. Well, uh, you know, a 16-year-old uh, had a, um, a a fatal collision with uh, um, a 70-plus-year-old person. And, you know, it's a horrible situation for everyone. Driving cars is dangerous. Um, but having high enough limits to cover you know, the assets that you own, um, it, to your point, Sean, is a really inexpensive way uh, to transfer that risk and ensure that you don't have to start this whole journey uh, over again. So you've kind of touched on it a little bit, but I just I sort of want to hammer this point home. Are there, are there any types of insurance where we don't want to cut the corners and go with the cheapest policy? Because our mind immediately goes to what is cheapest? Okay, let me have that. But as we've just talked about, not always the best strategy. So, like, how do we put, how do we frame cost in there? Well, you know, the the best way to think about it is 
really all about ensuring that you have enough for the potentially disastrous events, right? The thing that we, for whatever reason as humans is like, I have explicit coverage for my wife's engagement ring, but like, we really can't lose everything if something bad happens to that ring. And so the, the insurance that you really don't need is insurance that can't ruin you, right? Um, so it's like the difference between insurance of convenience and true insurance, true insurance being a prevention of financial calamity. And so if you think about like a lot of us will have cell phone insurance, cell phone insurance is great. It's a great product if you want the convenience of not having to go buy a cell phone, but it's not, it's not the it shouldn't even be the same word as the insurance that prevents you uh, from, um, you know, from turning over the deed of your house because someone got in a car accident. Right. So that's, do, you know, the, the most important question to answer in buying home or car insurance is, do I have enough? Um, there's tools to help you do this. Um, many people will be interested in paying an agent to help them uh, be advised. Uh, but, you know, largely uh, there's odds of losing everything. And for most people, if you understood what your net worth was, your home and car insurance limits should be close to that number. Because for most people, even if I told you it was a one in 500 year chance of you losing everything, um, and I can tell you, you know, what those odds are in any particular event type, that one in 500 is still too, too, too much for me, right? I, I'm working too hard to make this thing too great to lose it all over something I can't control. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's just such a great perspective. Well, Steve, I, I'd love to end every episode with an actionable money tip, idea, strategy, tool, anything that you think the Millennium Money listeners really need to walk away with from this episode. I think that as it relates to insurance, uh, three things that, that everyone should leave with. If you can afford the aberration, buy higher deductibles, you'll spend less money and you should do something good with that, that capital. The second thing is know that the most important decision you make when you buy insurance is ensuring you bought enough of it. And that compromise is a regret that you may not be able to live with. And, and then the third thing is there is a trade-off in the value of your time and how much shopping you want to do. And and from that lens, there are some companies that are just good companies that will treat you well. I mean, I'm happy to give a list offline, um, but find a good company who's not going to raise your price continuously because uh, that's their model of growth and ensure that you like the claims customer reviews, right? The entire uh, idea here is that we as insurance companies are stewarding your money to give it back to you in an effective way when you need it. Um, and so that's our great privilege is to pay the money back out. But not everybody feels that way about it. Uh, but that's the framework uh, I'd advise. Uh, it'll treat you well and you'll be happy no matter how much you spend. I think that's a great Great framework. Well, Steve, tell everyone where they can go to find out more about Branch and connect with you. Thanks, Shauna. You can find us at ourbranch.com, O-U-R branch.com. Uh, we're located in Columbus, Ohio. We're rolling out nationally faster than has ever been done. And, you know, perfect for the Millennial Money Podcast. Branch's mission is to make insurance less expensive so more people can be insured. Uh, we have a 501c3 called Safety Nest, which is combating the financial exclusion problem of uninsurance. And we believe that insurance can be good. And we talk about it with our members as Branch is getting back to getting each other's backs. I know adulting is just not always fun. And certainly shopping for insurance isn't always on the top of the list. But as Steve said, get the insurance you need to prevent financial ruin. In my book, I would much rather leverage an insurance company's cash versus having to deplete my wealth if something major happened, and I want the same for you. I think it's time we just shake down the myth that insurance is bad or this unnecessary expense. 
Find someone who has used their homeowner's renter's auto or umbrella insurance policy, and I'm confident they will tell you to run, not walk, to make sure you get set up. All right, the biggest gift you can give me is to share this episode. So if you enjoyed it right now, text it to five friends and tell them this is a must-listen-to episode. As always, you can find all the links to our guest as well as our sponsors right in our show notes. And I'll see you back here in a few days for a brand new episode. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com, where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode. Your desk setup is looking a little dull. Sarge is here to help. Add a goat gun to liven it up. Goat guns are miniature gun models to collect and display. Each goat gun has detailed working parts and range from 4 to 15 inches in length. They come in build kits that take 5 to 15 minutes to assemble. Make your shelf or desk stand out by showing off your goat gun collection at goatguns.com.